أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم Can all of you hear me? Resume with Surah Bakra, verse number 189. Let's listen to the recitation. Yes, Aluna Kanil Ahilla, will hear Mawaki to Linna Siwal Hajj. Well, I sell the Ruby and Tatul Buyutam in Buhuriha, Walakin. البر من اتقى وأتوا البيوت من أبوابها واتقوا الله لعلكم تفلحون وقاتلوا في سبيل الله الذين يقاتلونكم ولا تعتدوا إن الله لا يحب المعتدين وقتلوهم حيث ثقفتموهم وأخرجوهم من حيث أخرجوكم والفتنة أشد من القتل ولا تقاتلوهم عند المسجد الحرام حتى يقاتلوكم فيه فإن قاتلوكم فقتلوهم كذلك جزاء الكافرين فإن انتهوا فإن الله غفور رحيم وقاتلوهم حتى لا تكون فتنة ويكون الدين لله فإن انتهوا فلا عدوان إلا على الظالمين الشهر الحرام بالشهر الحرام والحرمات قصاص فمن اعتدى عليكم فاعتدوا عليه بمثل ما اعتدى عليكم واتقوا الله واعلموا ان الله مع المتقين Alhamdulillah, he woke up. Was salam on Allah, Ibadi Hilazina Stafa, and my bad. Sura Bakra, verse number one eighty nine. In the previous verses, we saw that there were several issues, several legal rulings in Ahakam that Allah SWT explains and before we looked at this verse which is Lays al-Bir, the ayat al-Bir and from that this discussion about different ahakam ahakam is sharia so that's the discussion that we are in looking at different ahakam is sharia different legal rulings and these are all chapters or aspects of bir of piety and righteousness in our deen so this theme of righteousness which started way back this was verse 177 that theme continues throughout these ayat of the quran and if we summarize then previously we saw that the first theme or the first ruling that allah subhanahu gave was about kisas which is retaliation then after that second was about wasiyat and the rules or guidance with respect to making a wasiyah or a bequest third and uh, the third aspect of the third rule was about fasting 
and there were different masail related to fasting then after fasting we had a discussion about itikaf and then the last verse that we did previously was that a person should abstain from unlawful unlawful wealth and rather they should ensure that the wealth that they have that they earn should be through lawful means permissible means now in the next few ayat we will see that there are two broad themes or ahkam or rulings that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions and these are number one hajj and number two jihad so first Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives us certain hukum about hajj <clears throat> and then after that we will have a discussion about jihad so this verse begins with something which is related to hajj and that is the time or the mechanism by which a person can recognize that the season of hajj is about to begin or has already started and then within hajj we have days uh, the days of hajj and then the days of eid which follow hajj so Allah SWT begins this verse by making mention of a mechanism by which we can understand time in our deen and this time will be very important because many of our ibadat in deen of Islam they're linked with time they're linked with ascertaining time and knowing what time or what season what month what day what time of that day we are in so the verse 189 it begins with this theme yes alu naka anil ahilla yes alu naka whenever you have this word ya at the start normally it refers to a verb and a verb where uh, it's third person and then if you have an ending like noon here yes aluna so this is a plural form of that verb that they ask they ask so all again for those who are familiar with Arabic language or with the Urdu language we have this word sawal to ask so they ask and this kaf means you they ask you this you is referring to the Prophet and they is referring to the Sahaba the Sahaba Ikram they ask you anil ahilla about the new moon now in Quran there are several questions that the Sahaba Ikram they asked the Prophet and Sayyidina Abdullah ibn Abbas radiallahu ta'ala anhu he mentioned some one sifat one attribute of the Sahaba said the Sahaba they had a lot of love for the Prophet but at the same time they also had a lot of respect and adab for the Prophet and because of that adab they were not very freely able to ask any question that came to their mind and because of that other that all that respect that reverence they had for the Prophet they used to confine or limit themselves to asking very few questions and this practice and this other that the Sahaba had for the Prophet was contrary to the practices of the communities of the past Anbiya who used to ask many questions to their Nabi so just in Surah Baqarah in the initial part we uh, went through verses uh, which told us stories about Sayyidina Musa alayhi salam and the Ashabi Musa the companions of Musa alayhi salam and how they used to question their Nabi and such a trivial insignificant sometimes even futile questions and excessive questioning and that's something which we don't see in the Sahaba of the Prophet sallam. so Sayyidina Abdullah ibn Abbas radiallahu ta'ala an he adds said if he were to add the total number of questions that were asked by the Sahaba and that are mentioned in the Quran it's 14 14 questions and most of them they begin with this phrase yes alu naka they ask you O messenger of Allah sallam, they ask you and Allah subhanahu is narrating that uh, in this Quran that they ask you and one question that we just previously you know, we just did this I think a few sessions ago was is a sa'alaka ibadi anni that when my servants ask you about me that's one of those 14 questions 
And then again, we have this question here. Yes, Alunaka. Uh, so there are six more questions that appear in Surah Bakara itself. And the rest of the six questions will come up in various other surahs. So inshallah, we're going to do those questions later when they come at their respective place. Here we have this question, yes, alunaka anil ahilla. The Sahaba, they ask you about ahilla, about the new moon. This word ahilla is the plural of hilal. And Hilal refers to the moon, which is a new moon. You can see the first day, second or the third day, the moon that we see, which is a crescent shape. That is called Hilal. And the plural of that is Ahilla. The meaning of Hilal is uh, to raise your voice or to make a loud sound, a loud noise, a loud sound, or to speak in a very loud, uh, loud tone. And the reason why this crescent was called Hilal is that when people used to see the new moon or the crescent, then they used to talk about that. And they used to be very excited and, and talking with each other about the new moon. And they used to, uh, in, that, you know, in that excitement, they would have their, their voices would be raised. Uh, sometimes, you know, we experience this when we, uh, when we see the moon of uh, Eid, right? Whether it's Eid al-Fitr or Eid al-Fitr uh, al uh, in many cases, right? When children, they see the moon, they're excited and they raise their voices. So that's the reason why this is called, the crescent is called Hilal and the plural is called Ahilla. Now a question comes here that Ahilla is plural. So why did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bring the plural, why not the singular Hilal? because we would imagine that moon is one. It's not that we have multiple moons. The reason is that it's slightly, uh, and it's, it's, uh, it has to do with usage. It has to do with experience. One answer is that we see moon every day and the moon that we see or the stage or the phase of the moon that we see every day is slightly different from the phase of the previous day or the phase of the moon that will come the next day. It's, it thins and then thickens and then com becomes a full circle. So that is one reason why it appears as if there are different phases of the moon. So to refer to those different phases of the moon, the word Ahilla has been used. So they ask you about those different phases. And another way to understand is that every, uh, every month it has a new, it's, it's the month, every month has a new moon. And with that respect also, if you think about the Islamic calendar and the different months that we have, the lunar months. So for each lunar month, you have a new moon. So that will also make it multiple. And hence that could be another reason why uh, the plural is used to ask you about the new moon. So either way, this is the question that they would ask the Prophet Sallallahu and the reason of the reason why they asked was that what is the hikmat what's the wisdom what's the what's the benefit behind this moon there could be two ways of understanding this question one is that they may ask uh, about the the cause of this moon the different phases of the moon that it thin it's thin and then it thickens and then becomes a full moon and the other the other possibility is that the Sahaba Kram, they could have asked about the wisdom that why does this phases, why do these phases of moon, they keep changing. Now, if you go with the first interpretation that they asked about the cause that why does this happen? So here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in reply, he doesn't give us the cause, the scientific or the astronomical reasons why the phases keep changing and etc. right? The science, what the cutting edge scientific research or weather reports tell us, right? That's not the reply. That's not the answer that Allah subhanahu wa gives here. Rather, Allah subhanahu wa mentions about the hikmat or the wisdom or the benefit. And this teaches us another lesson that when the question is asked about something which is futile, it's, it's, a, 
it's it's a question which doesn't concern us directly that what are the causes the scientific causes or astronomical causes behind these lunar phases then the reply that Allah subhanahu wa gives is not a reply about the scientific answer but rather redirects the reply to a, that aspect which is more beneficial for human beings that the answer is given which is something which is more relevant to us something which is not just futile not just intellectual uh, uh, but something which which can benefit us practically that knowing exactly what the natural processes are through which this lunar cycles come into operation is of not real benefit to a person's akhira so if that was the question then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the answer redirects and says the answer will be about something which is really beneficial for you and this also teaches us that Quran is not a book of science. You will have no doubt certain scientific themes and certain scientific phenomena and Quran speaks about the moon and the sun and about how they orbit and about the creation of the heavens and the earth and different themes of science are mentioned no doubt. But at the end of the day, Quran is not a book of science where we try to extract scientific theories from different verses. Quran, first and foremost and ultimately, is a book of hidayah. It's a book of guidance. It's a book, hudallil muttaqeen. It's a book which will guide people who have this taqwa, this fear of Allah, and guide them on this path of falah so that they can become among those who are the muflihun, they can attain success in this world and the way to attain success in this world is that they can attain success in the akhira. They're living, their gaze is on the akhira and when they are aiming for that success in akhira, they can, they can also get success in this dunya. So that's the goal of this Quran. And then ever, you know, re, you know in some occasions, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does mention aspects about the physical world around us but that's mentioned so that a person can take nasiya and hidayah so that they can use that fact as a way to know Allah subhanahu wa many times these divine acts you know the moon is a creation of Allah the orbit of the moon is a creation the waning of the moon is also it reflects the the wisdom of Allah and many times why physical world and phenomena and 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 uh, the nature natural processes are mentioned in the quran is because allah subhanahu wa wants us to reflect on this creation divine creation and we ponder we understand we reflect so that we can come to a realization of the wisdom of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because every act of Allah is full of wisdom and the act will lead us towards the, the actor. The creation will give us a glimpse about who the creator is. The majesty of creation will tell us about the majesty of the creator. The, 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 the wisdom in creation will tell us about the wisdom of the creator. So everything goes back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and we should we should definitely reflect and ponder on those ayat of the Quran, but as a way to understand Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and as a way to uh, find some way we can draw close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, to know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and to know how we can come close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So yes, alunaka anil ahilla, when they asked this question to the Prophet sallam, then at this time Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed this ayah. Qul hiya mawaqitu linnas That O oh my beloved Messenger Sallallahu Say to them that this ahilla, this moon, new moon mawaqitu This is a measurement of time. It's a mechanism by which a person can calculate time mawaqitu linnas It's a measurement of time for the people it's a stipulation of time for people. This word mawakit. Mawakit is the plural of miqat. And miqat in Arabic means two things. It refers to a stated 
place or a state at a time. For those who are Arabic students, they would understand this is isme ala. So this could refer to a stated time or a stated place. So for example, when, uh, if you look at the first stated place, so miqat would refer to a particular place where, uh, you know, time and location. So the miqat of place would refer to specific places, what we call the mawaqit of hajj. And the Prophet himself has specified places for people coming from within, you know, coming from within uh, that demarcation, that stated place, or outside that demarcation to perform Hajj and Umrah to Makkah Mukarama. And that has an implication, right? You need to know what the Mekat is so that when you come, when you enter, you should be in a state of Ehra. Before uh, entering Mekat, a person must wear the Ehram clothes. They should declare their intention, the niyat for Hajj or Umrah, and uh, they should be in a state of Ihram until all the rites are completed. Similarly, the word Miqat, and like I said, the plural is Mawaqit, can also refer to a stated time. So the Miqat of time, it uh, denotes a specific period of time when the, when the rites of Hajj have to be performed. Uh, and we're going to come to that, uh, the months, which are the months of Hajj. So the word, the literal meaning of Miqat is a time, stated time or place. Here, the meaning, the intended meaning is time. It's a measurement, a mechanism by which a person can keep time, keep track of time, Mawaqit. Mawaqitu lin nas. Their measurements of time for the people, by which people can can keep a sense of the flowing of time. And what this ayat, what this word is referring to, is that by using moon and the waxing and the waning of the moon, the different phases of the moon, that first it starts with a narrow thread and then it steadily grows and becomes thick, then it becomes a round, and then it gradually diminishes to return to its original size. So this different phases of the moon, this is uh, useful for human beings in order to determine different important times in their life. And these are times which uh, are linked with uh, ibadat and times which are linked with other mu'amalat or dealings that a person might have with other individuals. So the example where time is related to ibadat, and there are several examples. Uh, many Islamic laws, of it, they, they rely on the time, on knowing the lunar calendar. And you apply that lunar calendar and then a person can get uh, they, they can they can know how to practice those uh, things in the Sharia, ibadat in the Sharia. So for example, zakat. A person who is in possession of nisab, which is the minimum wealth possessed by a person to qualify him for paying zakat. So the zakat becomes farad obligatory upon the expiry of the lunar year. And a person, he may not be according to the solar year because in the solar year, he would be missing a year's payment every 36 years. And this is because of the fact that the solar calendar is 10 days longer than the lunar calendar. So zakat, the ibadat of zakat is linked with the lunar calendar, the moon. Similarly, the fasts of Ramadan, fasting in the month of Ramadan, they're also calculated by the lunar calendar. Ramadan is a lunar month. Uh, similarly, the time for if Eid, the day, that also depends, it's all, Eid is identified 
by the sighting of the moon. In one hadith, the Prophet ﷺ said that begin fasting in Ramadan by sighting the moon and then terminate your fast by sighting the moon. So the start of Ramadan depends on the moon and the end of Ramadan, the Eid also depends on the moon. Likewise, we have another ibadah which is mentioned in this ayah, wal hajji. The ibadah of Hajj also is dependent on the moon in the sense that it takes place on the 9th of Zil Hijjah. And Zil Hijjah is the lunar month. So a person needs to first identify when does this, the month of Zil Hijjah begin. And that depends on sighting the moon. So when a person sights the moon, then that enables the person to calculate the days of Hajj. And the 9th of Zil Hijjah is the day, it's the Yawm Arafah. And then after that, the 10th, 11th, and 12th are the days for sacrificing the animals. And all these dates are determined by the lunar calendar. So we see that on one side, many ibadat in our deen, they are based on the lunar calendar. On the other hand, we also see that many, uh, not ibadat, but other mu'amalat, like uh, business dealings or other financial uh, transactions or social transactions, there also sometimes a person can use, they can make their calculations of the year based on the moon, based on the lunar calendar. Now, in terms of ibadat, using the lunar calendar, that's necessary. But in our other social, financial, business transactions, it's not necessary. It's not far that a person sticks with the lunar month. We can also use the solar calendar. That's also fine, right? Uh, but we see that uh, in some places, people still prefer the lunar month for even their, even their business transactions. So either way, we understand that there is some hikmat, there is a wisdom, that's what Allah SWT is teaching, that uh, one wisdom is hiya mawaqeetu linnas wal hajj, that the, the, the moon is a way through which a person can measure time, and this time, different times, and uh, they can also ascertain the time for hajj. This is the wisdom of the moon, about the new moon. And this is a wisdom which uh, is only there in the moon. And it doesn't, and this, the reason is because the moon takes different shapes, has different phases, as opposed to the sun. The sun is as it is, it's just a circle, whereas the moon has different phases. And in several, so we, we understand uh, that uh, through the moon, a person can, it's easy to determine the time factor in their transactions, in their contracts, number one. And number two, well, Hajj, uh, they can also know about the days of the Hajj and about their ibadat, how to perform them and when to perform them. Now, now this verse, and there are many other verses in the Quran where Allah SWT mentions a similar subject, similar theme about how the moon helps to identify the counting of months and days and how many ibadah they rely on this. So in Surah Yunus, verse number five, Allah SWT mentions, Allah Taala says, وَقَدَّرَهُ مَنَازِلَ لِتَعْلَمُ عَدَدَ السِّنِينَ وَالْحِسَاب Then he determined it and he determined the moon and Allah's Father determined the moon by stations, manazil, by these phases. Why? لِتَعْلَمُ adada sinina, So that you might know the number of the years. hisab, And so that you can do your counting. You can keep a count. You can keep a count of their time. So this tells us the benefit of having the moon, that when it passes through those different stages and conditions, people can use that to count. They can use it as a mechanism to count the number of days, months, and also years. 
Now, it's interesting that we, in our uh, modern times, we follow the solar calendar and we use that for counting the number of months and the number of years. And the Quran does not deny the fact that solar months or solar calendar can be used as a way of measurement. In fact, Quran in, in, in verses, in several verses, Quran recognizes this fact that the sun can also be used for counting. In fact, in Surah Bani Israel, Allah SWT mentions about the sun that فَمَحَوْنَا آيَةَ اللَّيْلِ Then we erase the sign of the night وَجَعَلْنَا آيَةَ النَّهَارِ مُبْصِرًا And we brought out the sign of the day to see. Yani the sun, this is an indication of the sun that we brought out the sun which then illuminates the sky and you can use that sun to see, have vision. And Allah says, why did he do, why did he do this? What's the hikmah? What's the reason for bringing out the sun? So that you can seek the blessings from your Lord. You can go out and earn a living under the daylight. And It's the same phrase that Allah mentioned about the moon. And so that you can get to know the number of years and you can make hisab and you can count. You have some way of counting the number of years, months and days. So this verse of the Quran, it although it proves that you can count years and months and days with the help of a solar calendar, but here in this verse, this Surah Baqarah verse 189, here explicitly, the words that Allah SWT is using is with regard to the moon, and they're very clearly indicating that the preference in Sharia is for the lunar calendar. The lunar calendar is the choice of the Sharia. And it is a choice, especially in these prescribed acts of Ibadah, which relate to a particular month and dates of that month like the month of Ramadan, the, the Hajj season, uh, the days of Hajj, even Muharram, right? The start of Muharram, the fast on the 9th and 10th and 11th of Muharram, Laylatul Qadr, 27th night, the odd nights of, of the last 10 days of Ramadan, uh, paying zakat at the end of the expiry of the lunar year, uh, sorry, at the expiry of the lunar year, right? When the 12 months to pass, all of this is they're tied to the sighting of the new moon and this is the reason why Allah is saying here this lunar this new moon is wal Hajj. they're indicative of time for the people and of the Hajj so this ayat establishes that in the in the view of Islam or in the Sharia of Islam the lunar calendar has been given preference now the question is that why? Why has a Sharia opted for the lunar calendar as opposed to the solar calendar? And there are several ways we can understand. One is ease and simplicity. When the moon is sighted, you know, you can easily sight it as a small line on the horizon and you can realize that the month has started. Then after a few days, when it illuminates throughout the night, it's a full moon, then you can understand that this is the middle of the month. So start of the month, a very clear indication. You see the crescent, you know that the new month has started. Then when you see the full moon with the full illumination shining throughout the night, you can easily understand that this is the middle of the month. And then finally, when the moon begins to wane towards the eastern horizon, uh, and uh, from that a person can gather that the month is drawing to a close. Now, if the various acts of ibadat were to be determined by the solar calendar, then only those with the relevant knowledge of astronomy and mathematics and those who have that equipment uh, and 
be able to do those computations, then only such people would be able to deduce one month from the other. And it would then be necessary for every person to have those access to such computations or maybe simplified version of those computations and have such calendars, right? And uh, that would that would uh, prefer, that would privilege one class of people over the other, the literate class of people over the illiterate. And that would make the deen of Islam practicable only by those people who are scientifically literate. And those who are scientifically illiterate, the villager, the common man, uh, then such people, they would not be able to carry out their farz ibadat. And we see that Islam is a system where it doesn't privilege the rich over the poor. It doesn't privilege the scientifically literate over the scientifically illiterate. No, Islam, in Islam, the basis of privileging one over the other is not your scientific competency or is not the amount of wealth that you have. Rather, we will do this inshallah later, the, the, the basis of privileging one over other is not these materialistic things or uh, or this wealth or prestige or honor, these things. Rather, it's something else, which is taqwa. It's piety, it's righteousness, righteousness. It's it's having that uh, that fear of Allah Ta'ala in your heart. That's the basis of privileging one person over the other in the sight of Allah Subh'anaHu Ta'ala. This is not a valid basis of privileging one over the other. And one reason, that's one reason why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is linked ibadat with the lunar, with the lunar, with the lunar year, with the, with, with the moon. Because moon is something which every person can see. And it's simple. It's simple for every person to determine the month by means of looking at the lunar phases. And on the other hand, the sun, if you see, if it, no, it, it rises and it sets in the same manner every day, every season making it impossible to determine the months in this manner. So because of ease and because of simplicity, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has tied these ibadat with the lunar calendar as opposed to the solar calendar. Then next, after mentioning that the lunar calendar is going to be beneficial because it's going to indicate time for the people and also indicate the season for Hajj. Now, in the next ayah, Allah subhanahu wa speaks about something which is specifically related to Hajj. And in order to understand this ayah, there is a context. And that context that Shani Nazul goes as follows, that uh, there was a practice prevalent in the Zamane Jahiliya, which was that uh, when people, they intended to perform Hajj, and when they had, when they, when they would uh, put the Haram of Hajj on, then after that, if there was any need to go back to your house, Yani you are already in a state of ihram and you wanted to go back into your home. Uh, there is some need, some necessity, you have to go back. Then those people, they would go from the back side, from the back door. And they would not go from the front door of the house. And if there was no back door, then they would try to build a hole in the wall for this purpose. And they thought that it was prohibited to enter their houses from the front door while they were in a state of ihram during the season of Hajj. And in fact, they considered this to be a virtue, an act of piety, that we are in a state of ihram, we are about to perform this ibadah of Hajj, and we need to go back to our house. So it's a right, you know, righteousness and piety is that we don't come from the front door, rather we should go from the back door. And if there is no back door, we should make a hole in the wall and go and enter in that fashion. 
So that is you know, immediately after this mentioning of Hajj, Allah subhanahu ta'ala brings this ayah and Allah subhanahu ta'ala clarifies and, uh, and, and, and corrects this, uh, this, zaman, this practice of zamana jahiliya and says that this is not piety. This is not piety. This is not a righteousness. This is not piety that, the, that you enter your homes, that you enter homes means zuhuriha from the back. This is not piety that you the thinking that I will enter my home from the back. Wala kinnal birra. However, righteousness or piety or bir, we have done this word before, right? True piety or righteousness is manitaka, is in that person who fears Allah subhanahu wa Manitaka, who has taqwa, who abstains from sinning, who abstains from displeasing Allah subhanahu wa that's how we will judge someone's piety and righteousness. This is completely made up exercise. It's an innovation. This is not the criterion. And in several places in Quran, Allah subhanahu wa makes this very clear. This principle is explained several places that the basis of piety, the basis of righteousness, the basis of honor in the sight of Allah subhanahu wa is taqwa. Inna akramakum indallahi atkakum. That indeed the most honorable among all of you is that person who has the highest level of taqwa, who has the most taqwa, who is most God fearing, God consciousness, and have, the, have this fear of Allah in their heart because of which they refrain from doing anything which can make them distant from Allah, which can make Allah subhanahu wa upset with them. That is the criterion or the touchstone of piety. And then correcting this uh, practice of jahiliya, Allah subhanahu wa says, wa tul, this is now a command, wa tul buyuta min abawabiha, wa tu, that enter, all of you, you should enter, buyuta, enter homes, Mean from Abwabiha, from its doors. Enter homes, enter houses from their front doors. <clears throat> so in Sahih Bukhari, there is a hadith which is mentioned about the practice of Ansar. And this is again before the before the coming of Islam, within Ansar, there were the tribes of Aus and, Aus and Khazraj. And they also had this practice that they would never enter their homes from the front door after Hajj. But they would either have a back door entry, or if there was no back door, they would make a hole in the back wall of the house and enter from there. So Allah subhanahu wa revealed this ayat of the Quran to correct this uh, this falls or this innovation, this practice. And from this ayah, we also can take one important lesson, which is that these people, they considered it an act of virtue and great reward to enter their homes from the back. Allah subhanahu is refuting this perception and saying this is an act of sin, not an act of virtue. This is, it's not an act of virtue uh, because Virtue or piety is that you abstain from those acts which Allah subhanahu has forbidden. Now, if a person attributes virtue to something which is not given virtue by Allah subhanahu wa in Islam we call that an innovation. The Arabic word is bida, that something which has not been assigned value or virtue or reward or sawab by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and then a person comes up and they assign some reward to it on their own. Right? That cannot be done because assigning reward is not 
the task of an individual. It's Allah subhanahu wa who can assign any task as praiseworthy, any act as praiseworthy. So it's Allah subhanahu wa who tells us which act is rewarding and which act is not rewarding. It's not some individual who can do this on their own. And Allah subhanahu wa tells us which act is rewarding by revelation, either, either by some ayat of the Quran or by hadith by, through the medium of the Prophet system. The Prophet system then conveys that this act is virtuous. So on our own, if a person comes and they associate virtue with some act which doesn't originally have any virtue, then that would be, uh, be that would be an innovation. And innovation is also a sinful. And there is a very strong hadith about the where the Prophet said that every innovation is misguidance. And every misguidance will lead a person astray. And they will lead a person eventually to hellfire. Jahannam. So we should be very careful about this uh, principle that we shouldn't attribute any reward for an action which doesn't or originally have a reward given by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And likewise the opposite. That if there is something which is sanctioned by the Sharia, permissible by the Sharia, to hold it to be sinful, that again would mean that we are altering the command of Allah because just like we cannot assign some reward to an act, in the same way we cannot assign a sin because sin means that we are saying that Allah is displeased with that now how can we know that Allah SWT is displeased with that how can we say that on our own we need some revelation Allah SWT needs to tell us that he is happy with this act and he is displeased with that act then only we can term this act as an act of virtue and that act as an act of sin so we cannot do this on our own this assigning on our own this is the meaning of this ayah. Then enter your homes, enter homes, enter houses from the front door. The, this ayat can also be taken to understand a more general principle, which is that a person should enter just like this ayat is saying that you should enter your homes through the proper doors the proper channels this quranic principle applies to all walks of life all walks of life that if a person wants to attain some kind of a goal then we should take the proper channels to attain that goal here our goal is to enter our homes and the proper channel is to enter through the front door, not secretly from behind. So this principle that if you have a task, a goal, an objective, a person should take proper channels to attain that goal. And this principle applies, like I said, to all walks of life. These divine rules, they're based on human nature and common sense. And if a person, they deviate from these laws that Allah SWT has laid down, these laws of nature, then one may find it difficult to reach our goal or maybe unable to reach our goal. So let's look at literacy. One example, very simple example, that if a person wants to learn, they want to become literate, there is a proper way to start your education. You have to start by learning the alphabets. If a person doesn't begin their study by learning the alphabet, then they will find it either very difficult to read or write, or maybe unable to read or write. So anything that we do in our life we should seek the proper way for it. And, uh, you know, uh, one quick example that comes to mind is about knowledge. I think more so in ilm and acquiring ilm and how ilm works and how a person can acquire ilm, there are ways, there are mechanisms, there are proper channels through which a person can acquire this ilm. And a person should go through those channels. Uh, 
studying ilm in a systematic fashion in an organized fashion whether it's secular knowledge at the university or it's religious knowledge both things they need to be pursued in a systematic organized manner in both situ both systems we have a syllabus we have a curriculum we have uh, teachers we have institutions and if a person goes through those uh, channels they are part of that system then it becomes easy to acquire that knowledge whether secular worldly or religious so by following this quranic principle of doing things properly we can we can apply this principle in you know many other aspects of our life that we become people who are hard working have a capacity to make that effort capacity for studying and uh, and uh, we we follow this quranic standard and we observe this in different aspects of our life all right and when a person uh, after mentioning this allah says what taqulla this is again a reminder that fear allah subhanahu wa ta'ala have taqwa la'allakum why why should you have taqwa la'allakum tuflihun so that you may succeed Quran in Surah Baqarah we began with this ayah where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned that hudallil muttaqin this Quran is guidance for the muttaqin and then ulaika ala hudam mir rabbihim wa ulaika humul muflihun that these after describing who the muttaqin are that they are the people who believe in the unseen they believe in they establish their salah they give zakah they believe in what has been revealed on the prophet sallam on the previous scriptures they are convinced have yakin about the akhira allah says these are the people who are on guidance and these are the successful ones muflihun falah falah so taqwa is a way to get falah and falah like we previously explained is that success after which there is no failure it's that is that after which there is no zillat it's that happiness and 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 a state of joy and contentment after which there isn't that disgrace or embarrassment and what this means is that falah is a concept which applies equally to our dunya and akhira and to get this falah to get this complete success in dunya and akhira that requires a person to be muttaqi without being muttaqi a person cannot attain this falah and uh, this is explained in many other places in quran where allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives us like explains the different blessings and and rewards that a person get for having taqwa and if he Uh, try to identify we see that those benefits of having taqwa they apply to this dunya several of them they apply to this dunya as well as akhira so for example if a person has taqwa allah says that we are going to make your tasks e- make your tasks easy in this world your worldly task your worldly affairs want to make that easy for you similarly whoever has taqwa Allah says we're going to grant you a makhraj an exit from any difficulty then whoever has taqwa Allah says ya ruzukhum we are going to give you rizq bi ghayri hisab without measure unlimited rizq from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala this is all worldly Allah Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to give worldly risk uh, is going to give risk in this world and unlimited unlimited risk and provision to that person who has taqwa and not just unlimited risk but allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is also going to give barakat in that risk not just kasrat quantity but also baraka walau anna ahl alqura amanu wattaqaw la fatahna alaihim barakatin min as-sama'i wal ard that if these people of the cities had iman and taqwa then we would have opened baraka doors of baraka upon them from the heavens from the skies and from the earth 
so they will get kasrat they will also get baraka and in addition allah subhanahu wa will also grant them his own muhabba his love and his ma'iyat allah in quran mentions that he is with the muttaqin he is the companion of the muttaqin in allah yuhibbul muttaqin allah loves the muttaqin they become the beloveds of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and then also allah will accept the du'as of the muttaqin this is also pertaining to this dunya we make a du'a and sometimes our du'as are not accepted and we think that why is that so in quran allah lays down a principle that he will accept the du'as of the muttaqin so these are all benefits and blessings that a person gets in this dunya and then having taqwa will also be beneficial in akhirah wal aqibatu lil muttaqin akhirat is for the muttaqin the the blessings and the reward in akhirah that is that is only for the muttaqin and no one else that's the meaning of this ayah so when you join all the blessings of the dunya with the blessings of akhirah we get falah what taqulla have taqwa so that you can truly succeed in this world and in the hereafter <clears throat> then in verse 190 we begin with this discussion about uh, jihad and the rabt or the connection between these ayat is that we had a discussion here about hajj and ihram so in the 6th ah 6 ah and his 6th year of after hijra the the prophet sallam he was accompanied with the sahaba ikram and they left madina munawwara to perform umrah and when they approached makkah mukarramah they were not outskirts of makkah mukarramah uh, they were stopped by the mushrikeen by the unbelievers of makkah mukarramah and they were stopped at a place which is called hudaybiyah and they were not allowed to enter makkah mukarramah and the mushrikeen and the unbelievers they were very aggressive very hostile and they came with their hostility and aggression and they prohibited they said that we will not allow you the prophet system and the sahaba to to step forth to go forward and uh, after much uh, discussion and uh, deliberation there was a peace treaty that was that came into effect at that time which is called the peace treaty of hudaybiyah and in that treaty there were certain conditions that for example for 10 years there will there won't be any fighting between the two parties between the muslims and the mushrikeen in makkah and one of the clauses was that was agreed upon by the muslims that they will not perform umrah this year they will go back without having performed umrah but they will return the next year and the next year they can come and they can perform umrah and they will be given 3 days to do so 3 days for performing umrah now this was in the month of zulqada so consequently the next year in the same month which is zulqada the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam returned to perform this missed umrah Now this umrah in terminology is called umrah qaza. The Prophet sallallahu wanted to perform this uh, in the previous year but he was prohibited you know, he was forced uh, to go back. So the next year he came with the sahaba ikram and uh, to make up that umrah to perform that missed umrah. Now when the Prophet sallallahu came in those days this was the month of Zulqada. and this was a sacred month a month where fighting was prohibited there were four months of the year where fighting was prohibited 
Zulkada was one of them. So the Sahaba Ikram, they were a bit fearful that we are entering in a month where fighting is prohibited, number one. And secondly, this place, which is the Makkah Mukarma itself, Masjid al-Haram, and that, that sang, you know, the, the, the sacred place, the f fighting was, or bloodshed fighting was prohibited in that area. So well, there, there was a sacredness in two sense. Number one, the time, the sacred month of Zulkada, in which fighting is prohibited. And number two, the place, Makkah Mukarma, Masjid al-Haram itself. That's the place where fighting and bloodshed was prohibited. So on one hand, the Sahab Ikram, they knew this fact that we are approaching Makkah Mukarma in, in, at a time and this is a place where fighting and bloodshed is prohibited. But on the other hand, there was also a genuine and a very real fear, which is that what if the Mushrikeen in Makkah, they dishonored their treaty and they don't allow the Muslims to enter into Makkah Mukarma and they become hostile and aggressive once again and they start fighting and they incite them to a battle. So that's the fear that the Sahaba Ikram had in their mind when they were returning back. Now this is the seventh year, but try to put yourself in the mind that this is the seventh year after Hijra. Previous year, you tried your best to perform Umrah, but you were sent back with a lot of hostility and a vengeance and aggressiveness. And now next year you're going back and you're thinking that what if the same thing happens again? What if they don't allow us to enter? What if they dishonor their treaty? How should we, how should we act? Are we supposed to stay, stay silent and go back? Right? What are we supposed to do if they fight with us? So at that time, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed this ayah, verse 190. So this ayah is about a very specific, this, you know, these ayats, 190 all the way till 193. And in fact, even 194, these ayats are about a, this particular specific incident, which is Sulay Hudaybiya. And then the next year, uh, the first year when the Sahaba Ikram and the Prophet Sallallahu had gone or attempted to go, for Umrah and the Mushrikeen in Makkah had sort of fought them or prevented them from moving forward. And then in the next year, the seventh year after Hijrah, now the Prophet Sallallahu he left with the Sahaba for Makkah Mukarma. And this was again in the days of pilgrimage, Zul Qada. So this is the specific particular incident <clears throat> when this ayat of Quran was revealed. And in this ayat, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said to the Sahaba Ikram, a dispensation was given, which was that waqatilu fi sabilillah, that fight in the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Who should you fight? Who are you supposed to fight? Allazina, those people, yuqatilunakum, those who fight you. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is informing and giving them now the ijaza, the permission that they should fight anyone who fights against them. And this verse of the Quran marks a new phase in the Sharia. Before this, all throughout Makkah Mukarma, the 13 years that the Prophet spent in Makkah Mukarma, the, the, the command from Allah subhanahu wa to the Muslims were, was that they should be patient. All the verses that were revealed during that time, it advised the Muslims they should be patient against the pains inflicted on them by the mushrikeen in Makkah. They should ignore, they should even forgive when they can, and they should just build up their internal strength, become people of sabr, become people of endurance, become people of perseverance. They should not retaliate, they should not fight back. 
for the several the whole monkey period that was the advice that was the rule that was the principle that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala laid down after Medina after Hijra to Medina Tayyiba this was the first command when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala this is the ayah which uh, for the first time gave this command to the Muslims that they can fight they can fight they should fight the mushrikeen and they should fight those who fight against them so the command in this verse is very specific that the muslims should fight only those disbelievers who come to fight against them and wala ta'tadu allah says that you should fight those who fight against you and you should not transgress but do not transgress this word ta'tadu means that your hostility should only be directed towards those who are hostile against you but those who are not hostile you should not fight them and this is another important uh, chapter in islamic law which tells us about limits to every Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has prescribed the limits and principles and etiquettes to everything in Islam. And the, 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 the act of jihad also has limits. It has principles, it has etiquettes. There are guidelines and there are many. Uh, that's not the topic that we're looking at today. But we should remember this, that there are many limits and hudud that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has prescribed for engaging in jihad. Sayyidina Hassan Basri Rahmatullah when he was commenting on this verse Wala ta'tadu, that do not transgress he says that this is a general reference a general reference which includes that a person should not do anything in battle which is prohibited by Allah subhanahu wa meaning that there might be other people who are not taking part in fighting such as women and children and the old so you should not fight them you should not fight the women the children the old similarly if the people like priests and monks and others who have devoted themselves quietly to their own religious practices they should also be left alone you should not fight them the physically handicapped uh, those who are just casual laborers who are working but not fighting have no hostility you should not it's not permissible to engage them in jihad so this this is the reason why this command is restricted that you fight only those who come to fight you in a hadith uh, whenever the prophet sallam, he dispatched an army he would issue sometimes special instructions to the leader and he would tell them that they should fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala you should fear Allah and you should be good to your subordinates and then he would further instruct that you should fight in the name of Allah ta'ala only those people who fight against you who, who don't accept Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and there also you should follow the guidelines of the Quran and the Sunnah you should not deceive you should not mutilate their body you should not kill any children you should not kill any women so examples of transgression would include uh, mutilating a body a person should not do that they should not sever limbs and organs from a dead body they should not misappropriate the ghanima the male ghanima Right? So they should not even burn vegetation and, and trees without any uh, valid reason. So wala ta'tadu, that even when you fight those who are fighting against you, do not transgress the limits of fighting. Do not transgress the hududs, the principles, the limits that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has laid down in the sharia. Wa in, uh, in Allah la yuhibbul mu'tadeen indeed Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not love those people who transgress 
Allah does not like, does not love the transgressors. And one uh, meaning, direct meaning is that in this context that a person who transgresses the limits of jihad, they don't, those who don't abide by the principles of jihad, the etiquettes of jihad, then Allah subhanahu wa does not love them. A general principle is that this applies to every aspect of our life. There are limits to everything in our deen. And when a person transgresses or goes beyond those limits, then that person is not uh, liked by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So this, this ayat of the Quran is teaching us that we should fall within our limits. We should try to ascertain what the limits are. That requires having ilm of the Sharia. And that requires having some kind of correspondence with the people of the Sharia, with the scholars, knowing little things that we do. Small examples, mundane examples, like you, know, you, you, you work at your office. So I work at my office. Uh, what are the instructions? What are the limits there? Uh, and there are many guidelines about working in office. What makes your wealth halal? And there are certain things that if a person does, then that can make the person go beyond the limits and the wealth can become unlawful. For example, uh, wasting of our time when that time was assigned to do some work or some kind of cheating or bribery that's transgressing the limits of Allah in that workplace. Transgressing the limits of Allah in our, in our family when a person in their excessive love for their children, a person goes out and they earn something, earn in an unlawful way. So they're feeding their family, but they're feeding by transgressing the limits of Allah subhanahu wa Allah says, don't transgress. Don't transgress the limits in our family, in our marital life, in our relationship with our parents, uh, in our relationship with other relationships, in our workplace, even in terms of the love that we have. In, in a very famous ayat of the Quran, Allah says that Allah makes Allah lists all the different loves that we have. And these are the lawful loves that we have. In kana abaukum wa abanaukum, that if your love for your father, your parents, your children, your spouse, and the dwelling, the homes that you live in, and your tijarat, your the 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 the, the fields that you have, the you know, in generally the the trade, the commerce that you engage in, if your love for those things is more then the love for Allah subhanahu wa and the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and fighting in the cause of Allah then you should you should wait until the Amr and the command of Allah subhanahu wa comes meaning that even in our lawful loves if these lawful loves they take us beyond the boundary of deen they make us commit something which is unlawful then a person should hold themselves back. Their love for Allah subhanahu wa should be dominant and that love for Allah should prevent them from trespassing, from crossing that boundary. The primary, the dominant, the overpowering love in our heart should be love for Allah. And the lawful love should be part and parcel of that love. They should be tabe. They should be secondary. The trunk is the love for Allah. And the lawful loves should be like the branches of that trunk. So even in our love, in the lawful loves that we have, we need to be careful about the boundary that Allah subhanahu wa has set out. That's why Allah says, and that's why the Prophet said in a hadith that La ta'atali makhluk fi masiyatil khalik, that there is no obedience to creation in the disobedience of Allah subhanahu wa Yes, obeying your parents is fard, is required, it's obligatory. But not in every situation. If they force you, if they ask you to do something which is against uh, against your deen, then you're no longer morally responsible for obeying them. Likewise, uh, other, other aspects, other relationships. 
la ta'at al makhluk we are supposed to keep obedience of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala first and foremost that's the primary relationship that we have everything other than that every other relationship is tabe to our relationship with allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so this notion of transgressing is very important and we have done before also the deen of islam is it's the middle path sirat e mustaqim it's not a path of excess not of deficiency it's a path of moderation when a person practices moderation in every aspect of their life it's about the ummat uh, ummat wasata wasata to be on the on the middle path and when a person is on this middle they don't exceed the limits then such a person we can understand will be uh, liked by allah would be beloved in the sight of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so in summary there are two there are three lessons that we learn from these ayat today these are not just three lessons these are in fact three commandments that allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us the first is about the importance of the lunar month the lunar calendar that a person should uh, they should uh, they should have uh, you know there's one thing that i should mention that a person should have a recognition about these lunar calendar about the lunar months of this year and the reason is because we are living in a culture where all of our business dealings and many of our social events they are uh, we we decide them on the using our solar calendar which is completely permissible in the deen of islam but at the same time we should not forget all together about the lunar calendar that's also necessary and if that happens because this would then necessarily adversely affect our obligatory ibadat like fasting and hajj and some societies or some places we actually see some of that that some you know person in our offices or businesses or sometimes in uh, private or public affairs the solar calendar is used with such frequency that many times people don't even remember the islamic months if you ask a person what are the names of the islamic months sometimes a person may not be able to recall or remember all islamic months by their name so there should be some level of religious identity that we uh, should have and we remind ourselves of our religious identity which is uh, which which is important and uh, we can we can continue to use our solar calendar because that's what everyone uses and that's completely fine and permissible but at the same time we should also have some level at you know some awareness about the which lunar month it is and perhaps also know which date it is and you know we mentioned in another classroom that the blessed habit of the prophet says no most to fast every every month every month the middle three days of every month which are known as the ayame bi ayame bees when the moon is 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 full this is the 13th 14th and 15th of every lunar month so there is an indication even from that hadith is 
that knowing the lunar month and knowing how it's proceeding and keeping a track of the different phases of the moon so that you know fasting 13th 14th and 15th of every lunar month that's sun that cannot be done if a person is uh, not aware of of the moon right or is, is not aware about of the lunar date so we see indications uh, in several ahadis uh, in several aspects of islamic law that we should be cognizant and aware about uh, have some awareness about the lunar month at least that which month it is and then also some awareness about the dates within that lunar month uh, uh, we should uh, you know the, the the extreme position would be that if a person completely forgets altogether the lunar month and that would be that would be problematic right that would be a problem uh, because uh, then that would necessarily affect their about the fasting Hajj uh, the the fasting in the month of Muharram for example uh, the, the fasting in the month of Shaban not to say the month of Ramadan keeping a track about the last 10 nights of the month the last 10 nights in Ramadan Laylatul Qadr uh, knowing when the month of Zil Hajjah starts and then the related Ahkam of Zil Hajjah so for all these reasons a person should uh, have some awareness of the lunar month and uh, uh, some of our uh, scholars they recommend that in office situations or uh, you know with when you're interacting with the non-muslims then you have to deal with the solar calendar and that's fine but for the rest of other correspondence that we have or when you're engaging with fellow muslims or even fellow religious muslims or if it's a religious organization uh, an institution of islamic learning there in terms of correspondence or maybe events or other such dealings if a person can use the lunar calendar with this intention that we want to keep alive that religious identity uh, then that can also that can also be a way to get some sawab and reward from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because we will be performing a fardhi kifaya fardhi kifaya it's an obligation which if some people for perform then it will suffice for other people uh, so you know this is a fardhi kifaya that a person can do this with this intention and uh, we can preserve our some sense of our religious identity and also keep that awareness alive about the importance of the lunar calendar so that's the first uh, broad principle that we studied today second is we see that this zaman uh, jahiliya this uh, this uh, tradition or this practice that was prevalent at that time where they used to make their holes in the wall and then enter from the backside Allah subhanahu wa is rectifying that so this is a hukum here that uh, rectifies such practices of jahiliya deen is deen you cannot make something which is not deen and uh, label that as deen or something which is deen and you label that to be not deen that should not be done uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the sole authority who can tell us what deen is and who can tell us which acts are pious and which acts are impious and it's not up to individuals for me or you for anyone else to come up and declare a particular act to be rewarding when there is no ayat or hadith or nothing in deen which stipulates a reward for that uh, and then we also learned from this uh, as a secondary point that just like uh, we are told to enter our homes from the front door this principle applies to other aspects of our life that the goals that we have we should attain those goals through the proper channel and not use some improper channel back end channels back way or try to find some loopholes in the system but we should go with the proper system if we are education uh, if it's about educating other people then the systems that we have of curriculum teachers syllabus books etc that's the way that a person can attain education or knowledge right 
secular, worldly, or religious. So there is baraka, right? That's the way a person very quickly might be able to attain their goal if they follow the proper channel. And the third uh, rule or hukum that we learned is uh, that, which was in the context of a particular event, uh, which happened at the time of the Prophet Sallallahu where Allah Subhanahu wa Taala gave permission to the Sahaba and to the Prophet Sallallahu to be able to fight the Mushrikeen in Makkah, those Mushrikeen in Makkah who were hostile and aggressive and aggressive against them. So, Inshallah, this last theme will continue for the next uh, three or four verses, and we're going to continue this theme Inshallah next time. So we make the art to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala enable all of us to uh, practice and implement these lessons and principles in our life. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us people who uh, are people of taqwa. May Allah ta'ala make us people of bir. May Allah ta'ala through this uh, taqwa May Allah Ta'ala allow all of us to succeed in this world, to have all the blessings and bounties in this world, and all the blessings and fala in akhira. And may Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala also make us people who uh, can stay away from extremities in every aspect of our life. May Allah Ta'ala enable all of us to follow this uh, straight path, uh, the path of sirat e mustaqim which is uh, the path uh, uh, which is away from all kinds of distortions and deviations. There are some questions that uh, I try to answer. So there's a question about the moon sighting fiqh. Maybe uh, it's slight, it's unrelated, and maybe at some other time uh, we can have a discussion about that. All right, Hamza. What year of Hijrah was this? Seventh age. Yes. Sixth year of Hijra was the Treaty of Hudaybiyah when the Prophet ﷺ and the Sahaba Ikram were prevented. And then the next year was the year when uh, they came with the intention of performing that missed Umrah. Yes, Akil, uh, that could be one of the. You're right. That could be one of the benefit. That could be one of the wisdom, right? Wallahu alam. The more apparent wisdom is what we mentioned, I think, last time, to fast every. To fast three days every month. Uh, person can get the reward for fasting the entire month. And then we can link this with this, right? 13th, 14th, and 15th. Walla walla. How can one identify or differentiate between Bidda and a real practice? 
this is another good question but uh, this will require a one hour session we do this uh, elsewhere and inshallah and when the time comes uh, we can dis we can have a discussion about this also what exactly is beta different types of beta One of the guy, one of the principles of uh, warfare in Islam is that uh, mutilation of bodies is not allowed. That's something which is prohibited: uh, severing limbs and organs from the dead body or disfiguring. Uh, that should not be done. Again, this is a very big topic. Uh, there are many many ahadiths of Mubarakah that mention the principles of uh, warfare in Islam inshallah when we get to that stage inshallah we can have a detailed discussion that's a good question are the months of non-violence still important in Islam this uh, is coming this is verse number This is verse number 194. When we do the tafsir of verse number 194, then we're going to answer this question. All right, inshallah, we're going to end this classroom. And for those who are Arabic students, inshallah, we're going to take a short break and then we're going to resume uh, in the next, in the other classroom, inshallah. Jazakumullah khair wa asalam jazakumullah wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.